Okay, we're now recording. This is Austin Mackle uh, interviewing Neil Ketchley for Important Cool. Um, we're talking about Egypt as we approach the 500th uh, day of uh, the CC era. Um, we've got uh, uh, we've already discussed some of these questions, but it'll be uh, just in form of transparency. Neil's had a little bit of time to prepare because we wanted uh, him to be sure of his answers. Uh, we're going to start with who are the anti-coup protesters? All right, so thank you for having me. Um, so the anti-coup mobilization uh, begins uh, really on the 28th of June 2013 with a kind of counter-mobilization by uh, the Muslim Brothers and a fairly narrow band of Occupy Meden Rab al Adawaya in uh, in Nasser City in, in northeast Cairo, in anticipation of large anti uh, Muslim Brother and anti Mohammed Morsi street protests uh, scheduled for the 30th of June um, and called for by the Tamarud movement. Um, these protests have then continued uh, since for, after the, the 3rd of July uh, coup. Um, there have been daily protests across the country. Um, not just in Cairo and Giza and, and, and Alexandria, the three big cities, but actually in uh, many governorates in the Nile Delta, like uh, Sharia, like Kafr al-Sheikh, like uh, Ali Abeya and Nagharbeya, and also in Upper Egypt, in Asyut, uh, in Aswan uh, and elsewhere. Um, and these uh, protests uh, draw on uh, both men and women, um, uh, there is a very important role played by the Muslim Brothers in organizing these protests. Um, but also we see uh, new constituencies, uh, often young, uh, often fairly pious students uh, in university campuses who may not be affiliated with the Muslim Brothers, um, who are now organizing in fairly horizontal, uh, informal movements like Students Against the Coup uh, and Youth Against the Coup, uh, groups like uh, Sabah Sub, um, who specialize in very early morning protests, um, and all of these groups have quite a kind of unique uh, corporate identity um, and a kind of a repertoire um, that they have kind of uh, taken as their own. Okay, great. Uh, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Or just one yeah, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of a background on who they are? Who are the Muslim Brotherhood? Sure. So the Muslim Brothers are, are arguably uh, the world's oldest Islamic social movement. Uh, they were founded in 1928 in Ismailia, uh, which, is a sewer, which is a city on the Suez Canal, um, by a school teacher, Hassan al-Banna. Um, they quickly uh, eclipsed pretty much every other political generation and became uh, the largest social movement in Egypt. Um, and um, within uh, two decades of their foundings, found themselves in violent confrontation, uh, both, first of all with the British, uh, occupying force and then later uh, with successive Egyptian governments, uh, culminating in their uh, effective liquidization, uh, outlawing banning uh, in the 1950s. Um, in subsequent decades, um, they uh, kind of languished in a, in a kind of a state of semi-legality, uh, only to be partially rehabilitated by uh, Anwar Sadat um, and allowed to kind of go back into some or to, to, to have some kind of representation in political life and to effectively con uh, Islamic associational activities on welfare activities in creating schools, hospitals, um, in trying to spread their message of Islamic social reform and then belatedly uh, in the later 1980s uh, actually and in a lot of cases uh, doing quite well despite widespread electoral for fraud. Um, the Muslim Brothers then went on to play, um, I think, actually quite an important role in the 25th of January Revolution, uh, somewhat of, of an occluded uh, role. Um, the narrative of the mobilization against Mubarak often writes out uh, Islamists, but I think that actually there's a good case to say that while they were absent from the first day of protest uh, on the 25th of January, by the 28th of January, the so-called Friday of Anger, um, the, the movement had fully mobilized, and this was at a time when um, the uh, Mubarak era uh, state security apparatus was very much intact. And indeed, the movement took on a lot of risks and, and went on to play a very formative role, uh, both in defending Medan al Tahrir, but also in sustaining the mobilization elsewhere across the country. Uh, following 
uh, Mubarak's resignation on the 11th of February, uh, the brothers then took on a perhaps more problematic role uh, in the subsequent democratic transition, uh, seemingly uh, acquiescing to the continuation of powers and old re regime prerogatives in exchange for a kind of privileged position uh, in the democratic transition, um, which is in itself, I think, looking comparatively not particularly uh, uh, strange or, or problematic, but somehow in the Egyptian case uh, made the, uh, the Muslim brothers be seen or perceived by wise, wide sectors as being a new uh, Mubarak-like uh, uh, counter-elite, um, which was only confirmed when the brothers, uh, you know, having uh, pledged not to stand for the presidency, actually went on to, to put forward a candidate, uh, Khalid Shatid, who was subsequently uh, uh, found to be ineligible to stand, and then put forward Mohamed Morsi, who we all know uh, went on to win uh, the presidential elections um, in July of 2012. Um, and from that point on, the brothers became effectively the party of government for Morsi's uh, fairly brief tenure in power, only then to become, to return to this position of kind of semi-legality and then full-blown illegality um, following the 3rd of July coup, um, where they you know, are currently a movement which is under attack uh, throughout the country. They have been branded a terrorist movement, um, although I'm not, not sure that, that many of the charges leveled against them are necessarily true or fair. But they are, um, they remain the largest and most organized political opposition group, claiming between half a million to a million members. Okay, there's, there's a few quick follow-up questions I, want, I wanted to get some clarification on. Um, you mentioned uh, the violent confrontations with the, the, or, you know, the British and other forces in the 50s. Could you maybe just flesh out a little bit more the Brotherhood's attitude towards, uh, you know, violent... Uh, violence in, in politics and how that's evolved over time. Sure. Um, I mean, at their founding, I think that actually the brothers were, in many senses, a street pot protest movement that wasn't actually really into protest in the 1920s, in the late 1920s and 1930s. You see a series of movements emerge in Egypt, not just the Muslim Brothers, also the so-called Young Egypt movement, uh, the so-called Blue Shirts that began, began, belong to the, the Waftist Party, uh, the, 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 the Young Men's Muslim Association. All of these groups had uh, paramilitary wings, in, got involved in uh, street brawls um, and kind of messy street politics, which the brothers, you know, participated in uh, through their kind of rover unit, but were never actually uh, particularly violent or violence to pursue their political agenda. Instead, actually, they actually tended to focus on parliament. Um, and indeed, one of the kind of often overlooked stories of the early Muslim brothers is that um, they had a several attempts to stand for parliament uh, rebuffed, first by the British um, and then by the Waft in 1942 and 1944. And this led to a split in the movement in which a series of fairly moderate uh, figures, people like Ahmed Sukheri, who was the deputy of the Muslim Brothers, left the movement and joined another movement. Um, and at the same time, you saw the rise of the so-called Nizam al-Khas, the special section, who were um, paramilitaries who went to fight in Israel and Palestine in 1948. Uh, against the, um, the the newly formed Israeli uh, army, the IDF, um, and then who came back to Egypt and led the movement into a kind of violent confrontation uh, with the Egyptian state. Um, this continues for over a decade, only then for, the for, for many of the movement's leaders to actually renounce violence. And indeed, uh, since the 1960s, um, there's been very little uh, credible evidence that the movement um, has advocated or practiced violence. And indeed, um, at the moment, it has eschewed all violence, despite the, the routine use of uh, live ammunition against uh, anti-coup protesters, and uh, insists that under the well, they, they mobilise under the banner of um, our peacefulness is stronger than than your bullets. And I think that, that there is a, a, one of the untold stories um, of the last year and a half is that a kind of hydraulic relationship between uh, repression and Islamist violence, in fact, that hasn't occurred. And that actually there's been a, a um, fairly un like largely underreported uh, and quite universal commitment to nonviolent action. But there have been some violent groups, but there's not much to link them to the Brotherhood, is my impression. Well, I think that it's certainly the case that, that, that Muslim Brotherhood members have been... Uh, 
following the, the violent dispersal of the, the Rabah city on the 14th of August. I think there's good reason to believe that Muslim brothers uh, in Egypt, in, especially in places like Minya, in Kardese, in Giza, um, were involved in anti-Christian pogroms, for example. Um, however, I don't think that there's any credible, credible evidence to suggest that this was actually as a result of an order given down uh, by the central leadership. And indeed, that leadership denounced those violence acts and it hasn't occurred subsequently. There's also good reason to believe that young members of the Muslim Brothers, uh, especially Muslim Brothers students, are involved in uh, petty acts of violence against the police. So, for example, throwing petrol bombs, uh, throwing, uh, using fireworks um, against the police. But I think this has to be read in context. I mean, not, not to apologize for violence, but this is in a situation where security forces routinely use uh, live ammunition to disperse protesters. And these protests are occurring in communities in which small arms are prevalent. Uh, the real kind of protest centers for the anti-Q movement in Cairo, places like Helwen, Motoraya, Ain Shams, Zeytun. Um, these are places in which the community is effectively armed. Small arms are very pre pre prevalent in these, in these communities. And yet we don't see these weapons being used on anti-Q protests. Protests that are, um, if not fully directed by, certainly you know, command a large presence of Muslim brothers. Um, amongst their participants. And I think that's quite significant. And I think that there is good reason to think that that there is some uh, real meaningful commitment to Salme, a peaceful protest. Although at the same time, I think that as time, as, as we move forward, as we look into the future, that definition of peacefulness will change. Although I'm not convinced that, that um, the Muslim brother, Brothers leadership will ever um, commit the movement to a full-scale violent insurgency against the Egyptian state. Okay, no. um, there was another thing I wanted you to clarify. Um, you were talking about the Brotherhood's involvement in elections in the 80s and the, this, the this connection just lagged a bit. So yeah. maybe I could get you just to go over that again. Sure. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Just you, you talked briefly about the Brotherhood's participation in elections in the in the eighties and um, I think nineties as well, but I'm not sure exactly what you said because we just got some lag on the connection and it got a bit sure. dull. So just go so, over that bit again. So in the 1980s, you see uh, the, the brothers participating in uh, party list systems with other effectively non-Islamist movements, first with the WAFT and later with the Labour Party, um, effectively standing as independent candidates on or as, as candidates on other parties lists. Um, under Mubarak, you saw um, a fairly strictly reinforced rule that said that religious parties could not stand for election. And so Muslim Brother candidates would stand for parliament, not as Muslim Brothers, but on other parties' lists. Um, and in doing so, be uh, elected as effectively independent opposition um, in parliament. And actually went on to be the largest opposition bloc by the 2006 uh, parliamentary elections. Um, and this was all part of, this was a consequence of the high threshold proportional representation system that was that was in place in Egypt prior to the 25th of January revolution, that in cities couldn't get electoral representation and was a way of preserving the hege hegemonic position of Mubarak's NDP party. Thank you, um, as, as much as you, as you can say about this, what's happening in Sinai? I think that's a very Good question, um, and I don't have uh, for it. I think that um, we understand that there are uh, relocations going on, that there are bulldozings going on of, 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 of civilians' houses. There is the Egyptian state uh, claims that it is waging a counterinsurgency. Uh, the problem is, is that we we have no independent verification of this. Uh, there are no currently no journalists uh, active uh, in in either South Sinai or North Sinai. I think there are two conflicts going on there that I think are quite different or independent of each other. Um, and I don't think we really fully understand uh, what's going on. I mean, Sinai has always been a difficult um, and sort of remote place and hard to get reliable information about. But I mean, how, how, does, how does it compare in, in that sense now with uh, in, a, in a pre coup era? Um, if the question is, um, how, how is the Egyptian media um, in terms of its, its kind of uh, fairness, its balanced coverage. I think the Egyptian media has always had a problem in the sense that they don't have uh, professionally trained uh, journalists. And in fact, there's uh, scholarly work by media studies uh, scholars uh, on this question. Um, it's certainly the case that following the 25th of January revolution, there was a brief 
uh, window, a period in which it looked like there was going to be an opening, in which you saw um, new kind, new uh, newspapers opening, a kind of uh, a spirit of uh, free and critical journalism um, and journalistic enterprise. That unfortunately is over. Um, in Egypt now, there is very little media space for criticism of the government. Um, journalists are, are forbidden, effectively, to, to, to criticize the army or the president. And um, as a result, um, there is the, 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 or the, the formal media, the state media and the private media, no longer effectively holds the government to account. Um, that's that's very interesting. But what I meant was just in terms of a, of access for journalists, foreign or local, to Sinai physically. I mean, is that is that changing or is that? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, what have been the economic policies pursued by the coup government? Well, I think in many ways they're a continuation of uh, the Mubarak era and indeed the Morsi government. There is a broad commitment to to neoliberal reform. Uh, CC has been ostensibly quite successful uh, in reforming or at least cutting uh, subsidies where uh, Morsi and uh, previous predecessors had attempted to um, only to row back in the face of popular opposition. Um, at the same time, uh, what I think is quite different about, about the CC uh, economic program is that it's increasingly reliant on a kind of strategic rent. Uh, from uh, Persian Gulf oil producers. And that's quite different. I mean, we, we might draw a parallel uh, with Morsi's government, for example, uh, with the role of Qatar and Doha in uh, subsidizing or propping up the Egyptian economy following from following Mubarak's downfall. But now um, Qatar has been replaced by the Emirates um, and by Kuwait and by Saudi Arabia, who are now key uh, actors in in channeling petroleum products and foreign currency into the country to try and return stability and to allow the CC regime to consolidate itself. Okay, um, I was. I, this is you can't. You partially answered this question already, but um, I was. How do they compare? How do these economic policies compare with those of the Muslim Brotherhood? If you could just spell out exactly more what you think is different and what you think's um, sure. Well, I think that, that if you look at the, I think that that that, that it's important to look at the pre. Uh, 25th of January brothers economic policy and in particular uh, the electoral program they proposed in 2006 and 2010 uh, parliamentary elections which was effectively a neoliberal program but one premised on 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 the idea that 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 neoliberalism was was not working in Egypt not because um, privatization and the market uh, were not the answers but because corruption was somehow impeding the realization of market reforms and thus if you that actually the system would work. And that was, I think, the premise that, that, that the Muslim brothers were operating on, especially under the influence of, of prominent Muslim brothers like Khalid al-Shartid. situation where they struggled to kind of really implement any kind of economic reform at all because the state simply wasn't working for them. I think there's a good reason to believe that even uh, limited kinds of reforms were, which were initiated from the centre uh, were being blocked um, by uh, the wider bureaucracy. Okay, that's sorry, my no, internet has just uh, yeah. has just dropped. There you go. Can you see okay. you? Yeah, we can see you. Look, there's, there's two questions I want to. There's uh, there's there's two, there's two um, things I want to do now. First of all, I want to ask you. I mean, you talked about the 2006 and 2010 um, platforms, but I think there was a significant difference between them and the 2011, 2012 platforms that the brothers ran on when it was actually a real election which included things like collecting back taxes, raising the minimum wage. There, it wasn't, I mean, I don't see how either of those, for example, is um, uh, neoliberal. There was going to be substantial investment in um, uh, the Suez Canal, which now the CC regime has continued in its own more corrupt way. Um, secondly, uh, the, the other um, point I was going to make was the, the there was an idea of... Um, uh, raising the price of gas, which was being sold to Israel. What about, I mean, is what in the 2011, 2012 platforms, not much of which got implemented for various reasons, you know, there was a coup um, <laughs> among them. Um, the uh, There was a big difference, I think, between that and these earlier policies and also of the, the you know, the, the, the policies that have been pursued since. Well, I think you, I think you're definitely right to point out uh, the introduction of a, of a of a national minimum wage. I think uh, a kind of an ironic uh, 
uh, truth to uh, the Muslim Brothers' plans to reinvest or to, to rebuild or invest in the in the Suez Canal, which was subsequently, which were denounced at the time by the domestic media um, because they pointed to the role of Qatar in this as saying this was exa- this was an instance of of the brothers selling uh, the country's assets to a foreign power. Um, only then for Sisi and the new military-backed government to effectively do exactly that. Um, so I think you're right in a sense that that that. Um, the brothers were also committed to, to large scale public works projects, at least a handful of them. Um, at the same time, um, I don't think that, that the brothers were in any way committed to a distributive state or maintaining or returning to a kind of NASA era uh, distributive state. They were fully uh, embracing the infitair policy of, of economic opening um, and international investment and scaling back of, of, of state subsidies. And indeed, Morsi. Uh, attempted to do that on uh, on uh, alcohol and tobacco um, only then, or at least to raise the prices on them um, and to remove subsidies elsewhere, only to row back within, I think, 24 hours in the face of uh, street protests. Which he had to do because he has to worry about elections, whereas CC didn't because he doesn't. Well, sure. I mean, it's 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 certainly the case that 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 um, that CC has an easier hand to play. Uh, than than Morsi did. There's there's no doubt about that. The government and the state is working for Sisi. Uh, Sisi enjoys international backing. He enjoys regional backing. Um, there's no doubt that, that the Muslim Brothers were operating in a very hostile environment, both domestically um, and externally. At the same time, I would question uh, the Muslim Brothers' commitment to to the continuation or return to a Nasser era redistributive uh, distributive state. I don't think anyone's put their policy in, in, the, in the light of the redistributive state. Look, I'm going to show you, send you a quick clip now. It's fine, I have to. Okay. I'm going to send you a quick clip now um, of.